chaos in the skies. Brutal weather conditions causing aviation disasters. It looked like a bomb went off. A violent hailstorm shatters cockpit windshields and destroys a jet's engines. It looked like it had been beat with a hammer. A powerful downdraft slams a 160-ton jet into rush hour traffic. And a plane was coming over just like that, and I know this can't be real. And a vicious tailwind tosses an Airbus down a rain-slicked runway. You could feel yourself almost leaving the seat of the airplane. Ferocious storms can mean catastrophe in the skies. I thought, Lord, I've never seen anything like this. I didn't see how we weren't knocked right out of the sky. Eyewitnesses and survivors tell their gripping stories. Dramatic animations put you up close and inside troubled planes as they battle the elements. Everyone knows the frustration of flight delays and cancellations caused by bad weather. But no one wants to be on the other side of the weather equation. Onboard planes doomed to crash because of the elements. Mother Nature has a lot of fury, and she tries to warn us by giving us cues. In some cases, it's a rain shaft. Some cases, it's lightning. But Mother Nature is telling us, you don't want to mess with me, because nine times out of 10, I'm going to win. Spring weather in the southeast can change in a heartbeat. And April 4th, 1977 is just that kind of day. The four o'clock report from the National Weather Service shows warm and cold fronts stretching all the way from Lake Michigan to the Gulf. A volatile mix that could mean thunderstorms, tornadoes, and severe icing above 12,000 feet. At Huntsville, Alabama's Madison County Airport, Southern Airways Flight 242 takes off four minutes late at 3.54 p.m. with 85 people on board. It was a bad day. The squall line was hundreds of miles long. It was very intense. Passenger Don Foster settles into seat 18A in the back of the jet. He has a pilot's license and usually flies his company's corporate plane. But the weather is so nasty, he decides to leave the flying to the pros. We took off and turned toward Atlanta and Within just a very few minutes, we went into a pretty bad thunderstorm. Flight attendant Kathy Cooper is about to unstrap herself from the double jump seat at the front of the plane when the ride starts to get bumpy. When the pilot told us to remain seated, we're like, okay, yay. Four minutes into the flight, pilots hear on the radio, attention all aircraft, a routine advisory for hazardous weather in the area. We were in and out of such heavy rain at times that I couldn't even see the wingtip. In the cockpit, Captain Bill McKenzie is checking the radar to guide co-pilot Lyman Keel, who was at the controls. He's trying to find a way around the storm when he sees what looks like a patch of clear weather on the radar screen. We did not have Doppler radar in those days. We had a much older generation radar that required a lot of experience and tuning to be able to get the maximum information out of it. Instead of finding a lull in the storm, the weather turns violent. What Foster sees next makes his blood run cold. There was a big flash. A blinding bolt of lightning and the worst hailstorm he's ever seen. It started out as golf ball size, and then it got larger, and guessing it was maybe the size of oranges. It was very loud, very frightening, and I was scared to death. Cooper starts to prepare passengers for the possibility of an emergency landing. I know one thing I had their undivided attention. Yes, they were afraid, and they paid exact attention to anything I told them. 
It's not just the deafening sound of the hail against the fuselage that has Foster worried, but the damage it might do to the jet's engines. He has a dead-on view just outside his window. There's a cone, aluminum cone, in the center of the engine. It looked like he'd been beat with a hammer. And at that point, I knew we were in, in really serious trouble. 15 minutes into the flight, all hell has broken loose in the cockpit. The hail isn't just damaging the engines, it's cracking the windscreen, making it difficult to see. Hail can do a tremendous amount of damage to the airplane in just seconds. The one thing as a pilot you cannot do is panic. So you have to come up with a plan of action and execute that plan. Then, another terrifying sound. The left engine started to make almost a backfire sound. And then it quit and just died. 30 to 40 seconds after that, I heard the right engine make a backfire sound and then it sounded like it quit. So we had no engines left at that point. You say you lost an engine in the busted windshield? Yes, sir. Well, now we lost both engines. Three miles up in the sky, Captain McKenzie is frantically trying to restart the engines. Without power, Southern Airways Flight 242 has become a glider, losing altitude at a rate of 56 feet a second. With all systems down, Captain McKenzie switches to auxiliary power. With co-pilot Keel hand-flying the jet, it all comes down to stick and rudder skills. They go to hand flying, that is, they actually physically, tactically fly the airplane. After losing radio contact for two minutes, First Officer Keel asks Atlanta's air traffic control to find an airport for an emergency landing. The closest runway is 30 miles away at Dobbins Air Force Base. But can they make it with no engines? I'm surprised I wasn't screaming. It was. It was kind of a mind-boggling time. You just, I can't explain how bad it was. After two nightmarish minutes, the hail finally relents. Flight attendant Cooper opens the cockpit door to tell pilots the cabin is prepared for landing. But nothing can prepare her for the look she sees in First Officer Keel's eyes when he turns to look at her. I didn't know the co-pilot that well, but he seemed to be extremely competent and very level-headed, and he screamed. He was obviously terrified. I could not see through the windows when I went into the cockpit. They were so cracked. I didn't see how we weren't knocked right out of the sky. I really didn't. When they break through the clouds below 3,000 feet, Don Foster sees there's no place to land, and for the first time, he's given up all hope. And I saw where we were in the countryside, the rolling hills, the woods. I really thought, I'm going to die. We're not going to survive this one. Captain McKenzie knows they're not going to make Dobbins, and they're losing altitude fast. Foster uses his training as a pilot to prepare for the worst, making a cocoon to survive the crash. I covered my head up with my leather coat because I knew it would tend to ward off the fire. And I fixed the blankets in front of my head. Flight attendant Cooper starts to pray. I'll tell you something, there are no atheists in a foxhole and you become very religious very quickly. Coming up, Southern Airways 242's only hope for survival is to land in the middle of a highway. We were dragging power lines and treetops. Southern Airways Flight 242 is caught in a horrendous hailstorm. Baseball-sized chunks of ice batter both of the DC-9's engines, causing them to flame out. I knew we were in serious trouble when we lost both engines. Passenger Don Foster is looking out the window, and all he can think is, they're not going to make it. One of the thoughts that went through my head at the time is, I was an only child, and my mother lived alone, and I, I kind of took care of her, and I was, what's going to happen to my mother? 
Flight attendant Kathy Cooper is praying for her life. It was very, very terrifying. I still don't like the sound of hail. After seven horrifying minutes, the pilots are out of options. First Officer Keel can barely keep the crippled jet airborne. He makes the decision to attempt to land on a two-lane road in New Hope, Georgia, a rural town an hour's drive from Atlanta. 20 feet from the ground, he can't see what's just ahead. Keel manages to maneuver around the curve, but the road is barely wide enough for the troubled jet. Slicing the tops off pine trees and utility poles, the jet slams to earth. Touchdown was pretty hard, but it looked like it was okay. We bounced up in the air, and about that time the lights went out, and I don't remember anything from that point on. The jet veers left toward a convenience store, and its left wing smashes into a gas pump, triggering a huge explosion that engulfs the store. The wing crushes a car, killing all seven passengers inside. Then I felt a huge jolt from the, the left side, and at that point, uh, fire started coming down through the cabin. Like a blowtorch, then it would retract. Then it would come roaring through the cabin again. The jet slams into four more cars and a truck and comes crashing through the trees. It was the awfulest roaring and cracking of the trees, of, you know, of falling and everything. It was devastating. New Hope resident Marie Wigley watches in horror from her front yard as the jet breaks apart. The tail section landed right in there, and then the middle part of the plane right here passed the cedar tree, and then the cockpit landed in that yard. Don Foster is holding on to what's left of the jet for dear life. The smoke was so intense, I couldn't even see my seat belt. Flight attendant Cooper is wedged into a tiny space behind the front passenger door. I came to, I was hanging upside down in a cocoon, hanging by my seatbelt, and I could see a crack of light above my head, and I thought, I'm going through that crack of light, come hell or high water, and I did. And I was apparently the last person out alive. People on fire, people burning, and people was running and screaming, and and we was running towards them to help them. Local newspaper reporter Joe Parker arrives at the fiery crash scene within minutes. And I thought, Lord, I've never seen anything like this. Marie Wigley learns she has a far more personal connection with the crash than she ever imagined. The seven people killed in the car at the convenience store are her cousins. We was told that they, Kathy and Debbie, and her children was in the car that the plane sat down on, and they was all burnt to death. In all, 72 people die from the crash, nine on the ground and 63 on the plane, including both pilots. And I was sitting right by the left engine. Don Foster, though injured, counts himself lucky to be among the 22 survivors. I had crushed vertebrae, a broken left foot, and a cut artery in my left foot. I had four broken ribs, and I had burns on my face, head, and hands. The National Transportation Safety Board has begun a public hearing in an effort to determine the cause of the crash. In the months following the crash, investigators zero in on the total loss of thrust from both engines and Southern Airways dispatchers' failure to provide the flight crew with up-to-date severe weather information. Another disturbing finding, the captain's reliance on weather radar for penetration rather than avoidance of a thunderstorm. Investigators determined the captain of Flight 242 misread the black and white weather radar screen. It gave him the false impression an area was clear of bad weather. The storm was so intense that it was absorbing the radar beam and he wasn't actually seeing the severity of it. 
It's called attenuation. Since the crash of Southern Airways Flight 242, cockpit radar screens are full color and easier to read. Southern 242 brought home very clearly the need for more standardized weather radar training. Another improvement making aviation safer, 84 National Weather Service meteorologists have been added to air traffic control centers throughout the country for more accurate weather reports. One fact remains, the flight crew's courageous efforts to land the first jet in history to lose both engines to hail. They did a darn good job in getting as much performance out of the airplane as they could, and that performance was the glide distance. For Marie Wigley, the ground around her home will always be a memorial to the 72 people who lost their lives here that day. It's just something that stays with you. Coming up, it's Delta Flight 191 versus an explosive storm. Texas weather can be tricky and temperamental. At the south end of DFW, Dallas-Fort Worth's sprawling airport, it's a sunny summer day. It was a hot day, that, that's normal for us, and perfectly clear skies. But at the north end of the airport, it's a completely different story. An ominous thunderstorm above runway 17 left is about to wreak havoc on Delta Airlines Flight 191 on its final approach. And I looked to my right, and a plane was coming over just like that, but at ground level, and I knew this can't be real. August 2nd, 1985, Texas native Christopher Meyer is one of 163 people aboard a Lockheed L-1011 en route from Fort Lauderdale to Dallas. When I got to the check-in for the flight, they told me that I was sitting in non-smoking. I said, back then you could smoke on planes yet. I said, no, that won't do. Can you put me back towards the back of the plane somewhere? Meyer is happy he moved to seat 41J in the back of the plane. So far, the flight has been routine. Stewardess come back and talk to you, served you lunch, so just like always. In the cockpit, Captain Ed Connors, Second Officer Nick Nasik, and First Officer Rudolph Price, who was at the controls as the plane is about to land. Pilot said to us, flight attendants, take your seat. We'll be on the ground in 15 minutes. On final descent, as the plane is coming down to 5,000 feet, air traffic control transmits a message about a little rain shower just north of DFW. First Officer Price says, we're going to get our airplane washed. I saw a storm brewing. I said, hope we don't fly into that. Delta 191 is cleared for an instrument landing because of poor visibility. A minute later, the cockpit voice recorder picks up four words that passengers never hear but feel. Stuff is moving in. As we flew in towards the airport and we got into the storm and the plane started rocking, I mean, you can hear a pin drop that got so quiet. I never heard a plane that quiet that fast. I said, you buckle your seatbelt tight as you can because I think it might be a rough landing. Two minutes later, First Officer Price spots trouble ahead. He says, lightning coming out of that one. The captain asks, where? Price answers, right ahead of us. That means that there is a fully developed thunderstorm there and it needs to be dealt with very, very, very carefully. They're dangerous because you have this big airflow that is happening. I looked out the window and it was dark. I mean, just like night, and it was only 6 o'clock. Less than a minute before landing and just 800 feet from the ground, powerful winds hit Flight 191. In just 14 seconds, the jet accelerates with First Officer Price never touching the throttle. The crew knows it's a warning sign for wind shear. That means the wind is about to change direction. 
he warns First Officer Price to watch his airspeed. Suddenly, the jet is blasted by a very strong downdraft and tailwind and goes from flying too fast to too slow. Connors tells Price to push the throttle forward. Push it up. Push it way up. Way up, way up, way up. Instead of accelerating, the jet slows down all the way to 119 knots. Connors knows they're in a battle with the weather. Price goes full throttle, desperately trying to get the jet to climb. But the wind is too strong. Coming up, deadly winds hammer Delta Flight 191 into the ground. What I asked God to do that day was, God, don't let me die. August 2nd, 1985, 6.05 p.m. Just a mile short of runway 17 left at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, Delta Flight 191 is caught in an extreme downdraft from a thunderstorm. The jet is flying dangerously slow and losing altitude fast. In the cockpit, First Officer Rudolph Price goes full throttle, trying to climb out of trouble. But it's too late. Delta 191 slams into the ground in a field and bounces up. The plane sounded like it was gearing up trying to take off with the flaps fully down. Instead, it heads straight for Highway 114 and straight for Mike Van Noy, who was driving his mother home from work. And the plane was coming over just like that, but at ground level, I knew if I didn't pull over, I was going to get hit. Delta 191's left engine smashes into a Toyota directly in front of Mike's car, killing the driver instantly. My mother was screaming, unbelievably crying. Do you realize what just happened? The nose gear breaks off as the crippled jet veers sharply just left of the runway. The left wing smashes into two huge water tanks. Then 28,000 pounds of jet fuel mixed with a flood of water explodes, sending flames racing through the cabin. When I saw the fire coming back, I ducked my head and asked God to save me. Careening on the ground at just under 200 miles an hour, Delta 191 disintegrates, except for one section. It seemed like it was forever till we stopped. Only one part of the plane remains and is tilted on its side. The tail section, where Christopher Meyer went so he could smoke. Now he's suspended in midair. I undid my seat belt, crawled over one seat, and kind of hung on down, then just jumped. The next thing that came over the intercom system was we have a heavy aircraft down on the north end of DFW Airport. Firefighter Paul Reese rushes to the crash scene, but first has to brave the same treacherous weather that overpowered Delta 191. All of a sudden, it was 100 mile hour winds. It was a monsoon of rain. It was lightning. I mean, everything you could think of was hitting you. I was the first unit to arrive at that scene, and it was just total destruction. It looked like a bomb went off. Survivors are confronted with a grisly scene of lifeless bodies. I can't tell you exactly how many there are because we may be looking at enough body parts to make up another body or two. I, I just can't tell you that at this point. As you can smell the skin and the hair, and the air was all filled with just jet fuel. I mean, it just, when you breathe, you just burned your lungs. This is the only section of the plane that wasn't completely destroyed and where all the survivors were seated, the tail section, about the last 20 rows. Meyer tries to help as many survivors as he can. Of 163 on board, 126 passengers and 8 of 11 crew members die in the fiery crash. 
there are 29 survivors. This is what was left of a car that the plane hit as it bounced at least once just short of the airport. Brock Minton saw it happen. Then the car apparently must have thrown him off balance and he was in a 45 degree angle. Planes successfully navigate bad weather every day. But this storm was sudden and strong enough to bring down a powerful 325,000 pound jet in seconds. Investigators focus on a weather phenomenon called a microburst. John McCarthy is one of the first meteorologists to discover how quickly a microburst can strike. You have a, a time period that could be five seconds, it could be seven seconds, it could be 12 seconds, where you can say, I don't want to be here, and then take steps to get out. Microbursts occur when strong updrafts carry wet, warm air upwards. As some of the rain evaporates and hail melts, a powerful column of cold air races thousands of feet back to Earth. Swirling vortexes of air then radiate outward along the ground. It's much like water coming out of a faucet in the sink that comes down, and when it hits the sink, it spreads out in all directions. As Delta 191 flies into the microburst, powerful headwinds increase its performance and speed. Then, downwinds force the jet closer to the ground and slow its speed. Tailwinds decrease its performance and slow it further. Air vortexes deliver the final crushing blow. Once you fly into the increasing tailwind and you're into that column of air that's descending very rapidly, you need to get every bit of lift out of the wing that is possible. If you can keep the airplane flying for those few seconds, you come out the other side and the airplane climbs away. Microbursts are surprisingly common. It's estimated they occur in one out of every five thunderstorms, and they are surprisingly powerful. The judgment of where a thunderstorm is or what it is will always lie in the cockpit. Investigators determine the probable causes of the accident include the flight crew's decision to continue their approach into a cloud where they saw visible lightning and the lack of pilot training for avoiding low altitude wind shear. Delta disputes the NTSB's findings. Another determined cause, the lack of definitive real-time wind shear hazard information. Delta 191 is a turning point that leads to major safety improvements in severe weather detection. Doppler weather radar on board and the enhanced ground proximity warning systems are two of the great advances in aviation safety in modern times. Until we got Doppler weather radar on board, there was no way for pilots to assess the potential severity of a microburst. Doppler radar on board jets and at most major airports has led to greatly improved safety statistics. There has been only one commercial wind shear related crash in the U.S. since Delta 191 smashed into the ground in Dallas. Wind shear, wind shear. And today, it's mandatory training for all pilots to, quote, fly Delta 191 on simulators, which teach them how to escape a weather disaster. We have better training for pilots, better recognition skills, better tactile skills as far as how to handle the aircraft performance, and then better onboard systems to give the information to the pilot that, hey, look, there's a potential for a wind shear. Be prepared. I'm still quite amazed that there's as many survivors as there were. If there's anything fortunate about this accident, it's the number of people who got away. Christopher Meyer is grateful to have survived with only a few broken ribs. This was the shirt I was wearing that the nice doctors cut off of me. But the emotional pain Meyer feels is profound. You still think, well, how come we made it and somebody else that didn't make it? Because the guy sitting next to me and the guy next to him, they didn't make it. Coming up, in the throes of a deadly storm, a jet hurtles off the end of a runway and a raging fire breaks out. I saw this massive explosion. Pilot 
battling an intense thunderstorm, tries to land. I guess some people thought, oh, we made it, and then it very quickly turned into screaming and yelling. But touchdown is just the beginning of a terrifying ordeal. I really thought that at that point in time, we were the only ones that got out of that plane. August 2nd, 2005, Air France Flight 358, an Airbus A340, is cruising over the Atlantic on an eight-hour flight from Paris to Toronto. 297 passengers and 12 crew are on board the sold-out flight. Globe-trotting business executive Joanne Bundock is in first class. My job required me to go all around the world in the 68 different countries that we do business in. So absolutely, I was a world traveler, frequent flyer, was on planes more than I was at home. <laughs> Squeeze into the back of the plane in economy is 15-year-old Lisa Popo. She's headed home from a study abroad program and bringing a French exchange student back with her to Canada. I was just excited. I was having fun with my exchange student. She was beside me, so we were still kind of getting to know each other, and I was trying to tell her more about Toronto. As the plane closes in on Toronto airspace, the radar shows a line of violent storms headed straight for Pearson International Airport. As fierce thunderstorms moving through the airport area. Thunderstorms. A weather alert sends ground crews scrambling for cover. Everything was fine until we really got to Toronto and approached the city and the pilot came on and said that there was a thunderstorm, there was a major thunderstorm in Toronto and we were going to be circling a while before we could be cleared to land. After circling for 20 minutes, the alert is lifted and Air France 358 is cleared to land on runway 24 left. But as the plane begins its final descent, Tense storm Captain Alain Rosé and First Officer Frederick No had been trying to avoid is straight ahead. The descent was very dark. You could see the rain hitting the windows outside of the plane. Kind of thought, oh, maybe we're diverting. Maybe I'm not going to be landing at Pearson. With visibility deteriorating by the second, the pilots are unable to spot the runway ahead. Finally, at two miles out, they see it. I cinched up my seatbelt a little tighter because we were probably either going to do a very hard landing and stop very quickly, or we were going to do a missed approach. First Officer No increases the jet's power to overcome fierce winds. In the heavy rain, visibility drops to near zero. The jet's out of position, higher than it should be. Suddenly, the wind shifts from a headwind to a tailwind, speeding up the aircraft even more. The shift pushes the jet further down the runway. Everyone was kind of bracing down for impact. Runway 24 left, the shortest runway at Pearson, has little room for error, even in the best of conditions. Today, it's slick with rain. 24 left at Toronto is not a grooved runway, so that in heavy rain conditions, hydroplaning would be a significant issue. First Officer No fights to keep the big jet aligned. It touches down nearly halfway down the short runway. That's when it all kind of broke loose. The jet is racing down the asphalt at more than 100 miles per hour with little left of the precious tarmac. I was thinking, well, we should be slowing down, but there wasn't a lot of slowing down at that point. 12 seconds go by before pilots reverse the thrust of their engines to help slow down the jet. But it's too little, too late. Flight 358 runs off the end of the runway at 90 miles an hour. And careens out of control. I saw luggage falling from the overhead, and then it very quickly turned into screaming and yelling. The plane tears through a metal barrier, bouncing so violently its engines gouge the pavement. 
you could feel yourself almost leaving the seat of the airplane. The runaway jet has run out of real estate and goes nose first down a ravine. Coming up, jet fuel ignites and turns Flight 358 into an inferno. Of course, other people knew what was going on, and so that flight attendant said, Evacuate. A lot of liquid pouring out of that uh, of the hole that had been ripped in the wing. The official report into this accident found that the tire burst during taxiing. Then the exposed metal wheel got very hot and exploded just before takeoff. The plane took off, but 20 minutes later returned safely to the ground. The plane survived this scare, but it caused a major overhaul of tire safety. Concorde engineers installed sensors to detect underinflated tires, modified inspection procedures for wheels before every flight, and most importantly, as aviation expert David Learmont explains, developed stronger tires that can carry twice their normal load. The requirement was that in test flights, you should be able to have a complete tire blowout during the takeoff run, and that you should be able to complete the takeoff with no tires left. And that is what the wheels um, subsequently were, and never again did a wheel fail. That is, until 18 years later in Paris, when something goes very wrong. Despite all the safety measures, one of Concorde's tires explodes in fragments. Investigators dig deeper. They re-examine all the debris found on the runway and then make the most important discovery of the investigation. This 43 centimeter mystery strip of metal. When you match the 43 centimeter strip of metal to the damage on Concorde's tire, it's a perfect fit. Suddenly, the whole inquiry now depends on the source of this metal. Where did it come from? It takes five weeks of painstaking detective work, comparing it to the thousands of parts that make up aircraft. Then, a breakthrough. They discover the metal strip comes from the engine mounting of a DC-10. The flight log from Paris reveals a Continental Airlines DC-10 took off five minutes before Concorde. They track down the plane to Houston, Texas, and incredibly find the engine has a missing part. It's the metal strip fitted 16 days earlier during maintenance on the DC-10. When David Learmount first sees the photographs of the strip of metal, he's astonished. It had really rough edges, and this was not just rough edges because Concorde had run over it. It had been cut roughly. The edges were not straight, not even when it was made. The other thing is that it had holes drilled in it for putting screws or rivets through. And these were all over the place. Investigators now have a very strong theory about how the strip of metal contributed to the crash. 81 seconds before the crash, Concorde AF 4590 is traveling at 323 kilometers per hour down the runway. The tire hits the metal strip. The tire explodes and a massive four and a half kilogram chunk of rubber from the tire flies at high speed up into the wing. But Concorde's fuel tanks are in the wings. And the delta-shaped wing is not designed to withstand such an impact. This sort of eventuality had never been foreseen in trials. It was estimated in all the trials for certificating the aircraft in the first place that if a tire exploded, the pieces of tire that would actually come away from the wheel would be about one kilogram in weight. 
The chunk of rubber that hits Concorde's wing that day weighs nearly five times as much, four and a half kilograms. No one had planned for that sort of impact. What's more, you can match the large rubber fragment of the tire with a dent on the wing. But surprisingly, the wing is not punctured at that point. So, if the heavy chunk of rubber hadn't punctured the wing, what made the fuel leak out? The piece of tar which actually hit the wing and did the damage was so big and so flat that although it was so heavy, it didn't go through the wing at all. And it caused such a shock wave to go through the fuel that it actually blew a plug of wing tank skin outwards. The shock was that bad. When the rubber chunk hits the wing, it sets off a pressure wave which finds the weakest joint in the fuel tank. The fuel bursts out of the tank. 75 liters of fuel pour into the engine every second. But even fuel gushing over the engine needs a spark to ignite. Where did the spark come from? Air France Concorde AF4590 crashes after takeoff from Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport. Our graphics can simulate a virtual camera on the runway to reveal the cause of the accident. As the plane hurtles down the runway, a rogue strip of metal bursts a tire. 81 seconds before the crash, a heavy chunk of rubber flies into the fuel tanks. Fuel cascades over the engines. Not enough on its own to cause a catastrophe, it needs a spark. From the cockpit voice recorder, we know that the pilots have trouble with the landing gear on takeoff. As Concorde struggles into the air, pilot Christian Marty calls for the undercarriage to be raised. But it stays locked open. The only video footage ever taken of the doomed flight provides further evidence. It shows the undercarriage in the down position. What stopped the wheels from retracting? The most likely explanation can be seen in this computer simulation. Shrapnel from the burst tire flies up into the landing gear bay, where it severs power cables. The undercarriage is now stuck in the down position. Worse still, the exposed wires are whipping around in the gale force airflow. If the exposed wires make contact, they'll spark. As fate would have it, they do. That contact ignites the leaking fuel, and at that moment, Concorde becomes a flying bomb. We can now tell you what it must have been like for Captain Marty in the cockpit. From the pilot's seat, he can't see the flames. All he knows is that Concorde is losing power in engine number two just at the moment of takeoff. One second later, the control tower alerts him to the fire. Air France 4590, you have flames behind you. Computer graphics show how Concorde would have looked. Now to make matters even worse for Captain Marty, the number one engine is losing power as well. Events are conspiring against him. Aviation safety expert David Learmount explains why. There was a fantastic gush of fuel out of this quite large hole. It was literally drowning out that engine, which gradually lost power and finally went out. So the pilots were left 
with two engines when they're normally accustomed to having four. It couldn't happen at a worse time. Captain Marty needs maximum power and there's not enough runway left to stop. He wrestles Concord into the air. Cockpit voice recordings reveal that at 4.43 and 22 seconds, the engine fire alarm sounds. And three seconds later, the captain shuts down engine number two. The drill for a fire warning is that you shut the engine down and cut off the supply of fuel to it to try and, and then fire the fire extinguisher of that engine to try and put the fire out. Concorde is now 53 seconds from disaster. Gilles Rogelin in the control tower gives what help he can to Captain Marty. Do as you wish. You have priority to return to the field. But at 60 meters, Concorde is too low to turn around. So instead, Captain Marty tries to fly the crippled plane to the nearest runway at La Bourget Air Force, just five kilometers ahead. But there's a new problem for Captain Marty. The fire is now so intense that Concorde's wing is melting and disintegrating. At the rear end of the, of the wing on Concorde are the controls known as elevons, which enable the pilot to point the aircraft's nose up or down. The fire was so fierce that the rear structure of the aircraft was being virtually evaporated. The pilot's essential controls were being destroyed. At the same time, the toilet smoke alarms are heard on the voice recorders. For the passengers, fumes in the cabin make conditions unbearable. Concord is now 49 seconds from disaster. In the cockpit, Christian Marti battles with the controls, trying to gain speed and height. But he's being overwhelmed by the fact that the wing and its controls are disintegrating. Thirty-three seconds. The engine fire alarm sounds again and remains on for the duration of the flight. Captain Marty runs out of options. Even the runway at Le Bourget, now only three kilometers away, is out of reach. With just 11 seconds left, the control tower hears Christian Marty's final words. Too late. No time. Four seconds left. The plane dips below 15 meters. The final sort of act was the airplane reared up and heeled over into about 110 degrees of bank. So the airplane at that point became completely uncontrollable. Three seconds. Concorde could no longer hang in the air. It stalls and begins to roll leftwards. A hotel lies directly beneath. The plane is about to come down. Just 118 seconds after Concorde begins accelerating down the runway, 109 people are staring death in the face. Two seconds later, Concorde crashes into an airport hotel. All 100 passengers and nine crew on board are killed, as well as four people in the hotel. Air traffic controller Gilles Logelin started Concorde on its fateful flight, and he is a witness to those terrifying final seconds. I knew that everything was finished. I knew that, uh, the, that it was the confirmation of a reality that I, I didn't accept, in fact. And uh, because until this moment, I, I still, I think, I still had the, the belief that uh, it was not true, that 
it was not the reality. So it gave me the the point, I think. It gave me the, the the reality that it was over, that this that's what could not happen has happened, that it was a real crash. Concorde, the world's only successful supersonic airliner, has its perfect 25-year safety record destroyed in just 120 seconds. It's a crash of unimaginable horror. The passengers had only a few seconds to prepare for death. Two days later, relatives are allowed to lay flowers at the crash site. Even today, they feel a deep sense of loss. Jorg Meyer's father died in the crash. I certainly miss him. He leaves a gap for me that cannot be filled. What makes it more terrible is the fact that he didn't die from a natural illness, but in a horrific accident. And he was plucked out of life in his prime. The disaster was also traumatic for those who survived from the town of Gunness. Businessman Patrick Tess had a miraculous escape. He works directly next door to the hotel destroyed by Concord. To this day, he's haunted by the events. Well, of course the crash had an effect on me. You can't remain unaffected by it. See what I saw, the bodies, the fire, the injuries, it's awful, the smell of burning flesh is just terrible. For Concorde, the Paris disaster is the beginning of the end. Three weeks after the crash, all Concorde flights are grounded. Air France and British Airways, the two airlines that fly Concorde, have to make major safety modifications. Tires are strengthened so that they remain functional even when punctured by a 30 centimeter blade. Engineers encase the fuel tanks with bulletproof Kevlar liners to resist puncture. And electrical harnesses in the main landing gear bays are reinforced. Concord was never to regain her former glory. 14 months after the crash, Concord passenger flights resume, but the cost of maintaining and upgrading the aging fleet is too great. Passenger numbers decline sharply. On the 24th of October 2003, Concord carries passengers for the last time. The first era of supersonic passenger travel is at an end. Concorde is now just a museum relic. One hundred men, women, and children check in for flight AF four five nine zero. They come from all over Germany and are expecting the trip of a lifetime. A dream holiday. It starts with a supersonic flight on Concorde to New York. Then a luxury cruise in the Caribbean. Concorde is a plane like no other. Elegant, luxurious, and above all, super fast. Flying at more than 2,200 kilometers per hour, Concorde links North America to London or Paris in three and three quarter hours. Concorde's unique shape with a pencil thin cabin and vast delta wings enable her to race across the sky at three kilometers every six seconds. 
John Hutchinson has flown Concorde for 15 years. The best way of describing it is simply to say that it was a thoroughbred. It was a beautiful, responsive, powerful. This particular day I was not supposed to work. One of my colleagues the, the day before asked me for a transfer of shift, so he did my morning shift and I did his afternoon shift. With the change of shift comes an unexpected bonus. Gilles Rogelin is now the controller responsible for Concorde's departure. The Concorde is one of the most beautiful planes I've ever seen. Uh, the, the line is pure. Uh, I really like to watch this plane landing, taking off. During his pre-flight check, Captain Marty learns that engine number two has a technical fault. A small part needs replacing. It isn't serious, but with Concorde, safety is always paramount. After 40,000 flights and 900,000 flying hours, there's never been a fatality. The repair delays Concorde's departure by one hour. 3.54. Aeroplane, like, I don't know, the Kentucky Derby winner, if you like. By 1.30, all of the passengers are checked in for their supersonic trip. The pilot, Captain Christian Marti, is already in the cockpit preparing for the flight. The holidaymakers are in good hands. 54-year-old Marti is one of Air France's most experienced pilots. An adventurer of extraordinary talents. In 1982, Christian Marti was the first Frenchman to windsurf across the Atlantic. He's a national celebrity. On board Concorde, Captain Marty runs through his pre-flight check. His air traffic controller is the experienced Gilles Logelin, who arrives to start his afternoon shift. I was on GTL, the Southern Control Tower of Paris Airport, Charles de Gaulle. Concorde, the airliner that makes supersonic travel a reality. Sleek and graceful, flying twice the speed of sound, a symbol of prestige with a perfect safety record. But 113 people will perish in just 120 seconds. Now, using cutting-edge computer technology, we reveal exactly what went wrong. July 25, 2000, Charles de Gaulle Airport. 12.30 in the afternoon. The passengers start to board. Among them are the Eich family, Christian and Andrea, and their two young children, Maximilian and Katerina. Klaus and Margaret Frensen are both school teachers who've saved for the trip for 20 years. 